After more false starts than the smoke detector located above a toaster, Roger Moore had finally vacated the role of James Bond. <laughs> After a lengthy search for a new star, Timothy Dalton was finally cast as James Bond 007 in The Living Daylights. A new bond wasn't something that came along every day, like a new phone or a new low to human behavior. But in 1987, a new bond is all we got. Timothy Dalton would play the role very differently compared to Roger Moore. The new bond would be harder and tougher, more sensitive and also more dangerous, like hiding a giant metal spike in a punching bag. In the living daylights, James Bond is to provide cover for the defection of a high ranking Soviet general by taking out a hostile sniper. Of course, since the sniper is a woman cellist, Bond interprets his task to take her out very differently. Instead of killing the would-be assassin, he was thinking of a little light dinner, some wine, profiteroles from the dessert menu, followed by a play about, oh, I don't know, the Battle of Trafalgar, and then topped off by a 12-hour sex marathon. General Koskov tells his new British mates about his boss, General Pushkin, and his plan to kill a bunch of British and American spies. Unless Pushkin can be, how do you say, put away. Koskov is seemingly recaptured and the British Secret Service feel they have no alternative but to send Bond to kill Pushkin. Connery's Bond would have said, yeah, sure, why not? Roger Moore's Bond would have said, yes, but only if it was absolutely necessary. While George Lazenby's Bond asked if there was a possibility that he could get an advance against his next paycheck. With a few days up his sleeves, Bond decides to investigate Kara, the sniper cellist. That is, she's not a cellist with very long arms and a biting sense of sarcasm, but she was the musician holding the rifle. Kara's rifle was filled with blanks, leading Bond to believe the defection was as phony as that purported Elvis autobiography where he claimed he was really born in France and lived under the name Pierre Fufu for the first 16 years of his life. Of course, Bond has fallen really hard for Kara, but having posed as Koskov's friend, her eventual betrayal of him seems a bit like karmic retribution. Koskov, it transpires, is in league with the arms dealer Brad Whittaker. They've taken Bond and Kara to a Russian airbase in Afghanistan, where Koskov and Whittaker are using a Russian arms down payment to fund a drugs deal with the local Mujahideen rebels. Ooh, some of this has, uh, yeah, anyway. The bulk of the storyline of Bond following the trail is interesting. Faking a hit on Russian General Pushkin. It's the first time I've ever been grateful that James Bond is a good shot. Lying to Kara about his intentions toward her wayward boyfriend. You got that when the rifle was shot out of your hand. How do you know? The story beats are not all that surprising, but a James Bond plot that doesn't fall apart faster than a motorcycle helmet made of shortbread is appreciated. However, I've always found things start to drag once they arrive in Afghanistan. A well-executed series of action set pieces follow, first detailing an attack on an airbase, then followed by a climactic fight between Bond and Necros while clinging on for dear life. It's all pulse quickening, but perhaps it drags on for a tad. And then it's all wrapped up by a brief shootout in a sweet pimped out man cave. We have an old saying, duty has no sweethearts. We have an old saying too, Yogi, and you're full of it. What is Koskov full of? Answers on the postcard to this address. So we've got vim, vigor, deceit, hair dryers, jars of pickled eggs, bulldozers, and confusingly, I would like to win tickets to see Coldplay because they will play the song Yellow and I like that song. I, I, I think there's been a mix up here. It's possible there's a very irate viewer of this channel in the O2 arena right now, hate singing along to clocks. <laughs> After View to a Kill was released in 1985, Roger Moore was off into his well-earned super spy retirement. When the time came for Cubby Broccoli and company to begin work on the next Bond adventure, ideally set for a 1987 release, there was that nagging issue they needed to deal with. You know, it really wouldn't hurt to know who was going to play the title role so that the script might be tailored to their style. For example, a script tailored to Roger Moore's style would have more light comedy, just as a script for Sean Connery would avoid words with sibilant consonants. While there had been searches for Bond leads before, there were often reasons not to go with the leading choice at the time. Uh, the brand on the list was questionable, sir, so I took the liberty of choosing something else. Namely, it was easier to fall back on a marketable name like Roger Moore. Timothy Dalton had spoken with Cubby Broccoli on various occasions about taking over the role. Why me? 
but either felt he was too young at the time or the timing just wouldn't work out with projects he'd already committed to. Various people were tested. I mean, there wasn't a mathematics test or a multiple choice history exam, but we're talking screen tests with cameras and actors and everything. New Zealand actor Sam Neill was an early favourite, but was nixed by the man with the giant red marker, Cubby Broccoli. Next up, Irish actor Pierce Brosnan looked the part and had been playing a similarly smooth sleuth on American series Remington Steel. That series had been more or less cancelled, so Brosnan was free and very willing to take on the Bond role. And then NBC decided to renew the show that they'd cancelled. And even then, it wasn't for a full season, just enough episodes to prevent Pierce Brosnan from becoming Bond in 1987. So to Piers Brosnan, this must have felt less like a business decision and more like something halfway between a spite renewal and cock blockage. More Remington Steel episodes meant Brosnan would be unavailable and it's also been said Cubby Broccoli didn't want his next Bond to be an actor associated with a current weekly TV show. I mean, we all know Brosnan would get another bite at the cherry, so maybe all of these shenanigans worked out okay. A now delayed shooting schedule meant that Timothy Dalton would now be available to play Bond after all. Dalton was a serious actor. He's possibly the only cast member of the film Flash Gordon not on the verge of laughing. Perhaps because word on the streets is, Gordon's alive. Dalton wanted his Bond to go back to the Bond of the Ian Fleming novels, a harder Bond, and one without the flippant humour that had characterised most of the Bond films. Timothy Dalton has a terrific sense of comedic timing when he wants to, but he didn't want his Bond films to feel like they needed a laugh track. What happened? Salt corrosion. <laughs> what is this? I've had a few optional extras installed. Timothy Dalton made a fine Bond, but the stark contrast between him and Roger Moore may have been tough for audiences to swallow. Dalton does have a habit of stepping on the comedic one-liners like someone trying to avoid the cracks between tiles, but unfortunately for them, it's mosaic tiles. What happened? He got the boot. Dalton's Bond is played as real. He's not a thuggish, blunt instrument, but a man who feels and does not like the killing part of his job. I mean, look, I totally sympathise. I really hate having to update my timesheets. It's totally exactly the same thing. Miriam Darbo is the Czech chick cellist Kara. At first, she's the villain's girlfriend, set up by Koskov to be killed by Bond, who of course instead falls in love with her. Kara is a fairly well-rounded and relatively normal person compared to most of the 80s Bond women. A civilian, though one having an affair with a high-ranking Soviet official who gave her a Stradivarius, which I've only recently learned is an expensive musical instrument and not an infection. A famous one, the Lady Rose. Georgi got it in New York. Quite a Dutch actor Jeroen Krabbe is the charming yet oily fake Russian defector Koskov and is apparently not the founder of Costco. His henchman Necro strangles people with his Walkman headphones, but as he only seems to have access to one cassette single of a Chrissy Hine song, which no matter how good the song might be, if that's all he's been listening to over and over, it might possibly explain why he's so ready to kill. The real villain of the piece is Koskov's business partner Whittaker. He's a pathetic wannabe soldier, but as written, doesn't have any oomph in the script for the audience to take him seriously as the main villain. We never see him do anything all that villainous other than be a blustering dickhead. You know, you could have been a liar rich man. Sort of a poor dead one. Joe Don Baker would of course play a different character alongside Brosnan's Bond in the 1990s. But, ladies and gentlemen, in a decade of weak and ordinary Bond villains, as written, Whitaker is not necessarily the worst, but the least effective of the lot. M continues as before, as does Q, but we have a new Miss Moneypenny, played by Carolyn Bliss, whose screen time is more limited than an Amish teenager. Living Daylights has more than a few familiar faces in various roles. Art Malik appears as Afghan resistance leader Cameron Shah, Julie T. Wallace from the original version of Life and Loves of a She-Devil, Virginia Hay from Mad Max 2 and Farscape, and there's even Hawk the Slayer as Felix Leiter, and John Reese davies of course, who was in everything. May I ask why? After Roger Moore's Bond was firmly associated with the Lotus Esprit, Dalton's Bond would be back behind the wheel of an Aston Martin, now a V8 Vantage Volante. And of course, it's tricked out with lasers, missiles, spiked wheels and skids. But does it have turbo boost? 
Lots of things date in films, Bond or otherwise. Every film is a product of its time, for better or worse. Sometimes in a Bond film it's the amount of objectification of the women, sometimes it's the worldview that's changed, but in The Living Daylights, the single biggest thing to date this film was Bond having a keyring finder. Keyring finder? This chunky device was briefly the must-have gadget around 1986. You put this thing on your keyring and if you whistled the right note, the keyring finder would beep and you could, in theory, find your lost car keys. It's like a less stupid version of the movie Taken 2. This giant's lump of plastic you carried with you everywhere you went didn't do anything else. It didn't unlock your car, nor did it open your garage, and if you had your keys anywhere near a stereo or a television, the bloody thing would go off every 15 seconds. I would love to see the data from battery manufacturers charting the decline of sales of the batteries used in keyring finders, as I suspect users got sick of the damn things and didn't bother replacing a depleted battery. <laughs> John Barry provides his last musical score for a Bond film, a pretty decent one based partly on his work with Chrissy Hind and partly on his work with the band AHA for the film's title song. Apparently working with Duran Duran on the previous film was a great experience, but AHA was another matter entirely. AHA! The Living Daylights is generally a nice looking film with glamorous European locations juxtaposed with arid desert scenes. It's a rather polished production with an interesting plot, good script and a good cast. So what's missing? Trying to define an indefinable something is tricky and unreliable, like trying to pinpoint exactly which puppy farted. The Living Daylights is a film where the individual parts are all very good, but the whole just seems solid and fine rather than outstanding or great. It's one of the best, if not the best, Bond film directed by John Glenn. But, like most of John Glenn's films, there's just a missing sparkle that characterised Bond's best films. The Living Daylights was a fairly successful film in financial terms and critical reaction. But by 1987, the action movie market was being shaken up by the likes of violent R-rated action films featuring the likes of Sylvester Stallone and Arnold Schwarzenegger, as well as the burgeoning home video rental market with cheap knockoffs starring the likes of Bill Vester Balone and Marvin Schwampenbigger. Films like Beverly Hills Cop 2, Robocop Predator and Richard Donner's first lethal weapon film had been nibbling away at Bond's lunch, out earning the Living Daylight's box office take in the US. Whoever she was must have scared the Living Daylights out of her. Whereas Bond films had followed the if it ain't broke, don't fix it maxim, for Dalton's second film, the motto would be, eh, if you can't beat them, join them. If you enjoyed this video, please like and subscribe, leave a comment below or check out some of our other videos.